anywhere to what we saw on Monday with the votes by Anthony, uh, John, and uh, Steve. And so the topic is, let's say, in the first day we saw models of single Asian dynamic models of learning and connections to strategic and then, let's say using strategic settings in settings with strategic communication with the region. And today we will continue broadly in this topic. Mm, let's say the approach will be a bit different across talks. Some talks that have more an economic approach, other talks more a CS approach, but that's why. We are here to combine the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. So the first speaker is I think with an assistant professor in uh, the Department of Computer Science in Chicago. So the first is yours. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, Markov persuasion process or MPP, and uh, it's a reinforcement learning. Uh, this is based on two papers. One is a working paper with Matthew Hatchup at UVA, and another is a recent UC paper with uh, my PhD student Di Bang Wu from U Chicago and uh, Zi Xuan Zhang from Georgia Tech, Zhou Feng from Google Research, Zhao Ran Wang from Northwestern, Zhou Ran from Yale, and Mike Jordan from uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, I'm high from so. um, That's the outline for my talk today. So I'm going to start by introducing the model of Markov persuasion process or MPP. And then I'll talk about how to do optimal planning MPP and then how to do reinforcement learning. Uh, I should start by saying that this is a kind of pretty new model that I'm very excited about, but there are a lot of open problems here. So I would be happy to discuss during the talk or afterwards. Um, so what I'm, what I'm going to show you today is what we know so far, but uh, I think there's a lot of interesting open problems here. Um, okay, so I want to start with a kind of a, you know, textbook style problem that almost everyone here knows, right? That's the Markov decision process. Uh, this is a very kind of famous planning problem. We have an agent. You know, uh, the agent is trying to interact with the environment and try to make decisions. So typically, you know, this repeats at every round, the agent is going to observe some state from the environment and then try to, based on the state, to take some action to react on it. And then the environment may transition to a different state as prime according to some transition probability or transition kernel. And meanwhile, the agent receives some reward that depends on the states and also the action. It's pretty standard stuff. And, uh, but the important thing to note here is that in this problem, we somehow assume the agent has a dual role. The agent can both observe the state of nature and also then act, right? And what this talk is about is we're gonna look at the case where the state observer is gonna be a different from the uh, actor in this problem. Uh, in particular, we have an observer who will also be our planner in this uh, MPP model, can observe the state of the world. But uh, the another agent, the actor, is going uh, to act by taking actions. And, but both the agents are going to derive utility from this process. You know, the planner is going to get some reward, and agent, uh, the actor is going to get some utility as well. But how do these two agents kind of interact with each other. And this is where the idea of persuasion comes into the picture. Uh, in particular, you can see that the observer have an information advantage, right? The observer can observe the state of the world, but the actor may only have some prior belief about the state. And therefore, the observer can then influence the actor's behavior by strategically communicating this realized state to the actor. And this is what, uh, you know, ha that has been very extensively studied in econ literature, it's called the persuasion or information design. Yes. Uh, okay. So do the, the question is, do the planner and the actor care about long-term or short-term? So, uh, to answer, so the answer is you can choose uh, whatever model and assumption you want in your application, but for this talk, we're going to assume that the planner cares about the long-term utility, but the actor only care about the short-term utility. I'm going to tell you why I want to focus on this in, the, in this talk, but, it, but you don't have to do, do this. Depending on your application, the actor can be long-term as well. Any other questions? OK, so you know, why, you know, why we care about this case, you know, why sometimes the planner is going to be different from the actor. It turns out that this actually happens a lot in many applications. For example, if you think about the ride-sharing platforms, right? The, the platform really has a lot of information about the system, 
uh, for example, the supply and the demand and stuff. But you, but usually, the, but the system cannot drive. The system have to rely on a lot of drivers to act and then derive utility from this process. And that's why you see, you know, uh, apps like Uber can partially reveal some kind of uh, search information to the driver with the hope to kind of uh, uh, influence the driver's behavior. And this is already happening in reality. Another example is a lot of kind of digital market like bookings.com or Amazon. Here, you know, these markets have a lot of information about the, uh, the online items like the hotel for sale, uh, but its revenue ultimately was generated by the consumers who decide to purchase or not. And that is why you see those kind of booking.com, they actually reveal information like, you know, there were seven people booked in the past six hours or two people booked in the past one hour and so on. And this kind of information also affected the consumer's purchase behavior. Uh, another example is Google Map, right? Google Map knows a lot of traffic information, but ultimately the congestion was decided by the driver's choice. The, 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 you know, the driver's choice is going to determine the congestion. And here you can see Google Map reveals information to us in order to guide our choice of the action. And you know, many, another kind of is more real life example is the managers typically know better about the state of some project, but ultimately have to rely on the underlines to do the work. Uh, I guess some professors here maybe also know what, what that is mean. So after becoming <laughs> a faculty, I, I, I somehow feel more and more that I'm doing the Markov persuasion process nowadays. Uh, so you know, that's, you know, this kind of things happens a lot in reality. Um, and therefore, that's why, you know, in this case, we can look at how the planner can influence the actor's decision uh, via persuasion. Sorry. Yes. Apart from these applications, um, the planner also relies on the actor to generate the information. Uh, yes, so that they is. They are more important because, for instance, consumers have gone to certain hotels. Is that important? <laughs> Uh, that, that, so that will not be important to the model I'm going to talk about today because right. the actor is going to be my author. So after the actor generates information and then left to the system. Right, right. But, but no, I guess what I'm asking is, does the planner say for free or does he rely on the consumer generating information? So this is a persuasion model. I guess what you're referring to the delegation model. So this is basically... I don't know what you mean by delegation. Here the planner knows the state the actor doesn't. Right? right, but I'm just saying in a couple of the applications that's not obvious. To me. <coughs> I just wanted to ask if that's important. But that's like when you see the model. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that uh, that is not important. But I'm going to assume that the planner observes exactly the state, right, uh, okay. which was not affected by the current actor. Right. Uh, okay. So you mentioned the agent is uh, only cares about current uh, payoff, right? Yeah. Is the agent long lived, meaning that interact multiple times? So for the application I talked about here, I think it's a natural to assume the agent is myopic because imagine you are a driver, right, in the right shared system. Between your two constitutive actions, presumably Uber has been interacted with so many different drivers in between. Therefore, you can equally view the next interaction as a fresh new one. Okay, yeah. but I observe the stage, right? You mean the agent? The agent cannot observe the stage. It's like the agent cannot observe the supply and the demand in the system unless Uber tells you. But if I'm a driver, if I go to a particular place that Uber says, okay, there is a, a, a search price in this area because it's very crowded, I go there and I see that, oh, no one is there. Oh, mm -hmm. so yeah. observe that sort of at this partial state. Uh, good. So here, the important thing here is the agent do not observe the state before the text action. Right. After you take the action, it's okay to observe the state because nothing's going to change anymore. You already take the action and you leave the, you leave the system first. The, the important thing is you don't observe the state before you take the action. And that gives me the opportunity to persuade you to take some action I want you to take. Yeah. Good. 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 Uh, yeah, that is a good question. So I somehow implicitly embedded a commitment or something into that this is a software that's implemented. So you, after like a, a year's operation of Uber, for example, everyone knows what the strategy is like, whether their recommendation is persuasive or not. So that, that is how I justify the commitment. Good. 
Okay, so good. Yeah. So hopefully this convinces you that you know, there's a lot of situations where the planner is going to be different from the actors. And to be kind of uh, to give a concrete example about how the planner can use information to influence the actor's behavior. So let me kind of jump uh, use this uh, example of uh, revealing the item popularity in order to influence a consumer's uh, purchase behavior. By the way, this is a, this is a real problem. It's already happening in reality. What I'm going to do next is basically just trying to concretize this example with some kind of math, uh, some kind of simple math, actually. Okay. Um, so, you know, for now, for simplicity, let's assume there's an online item that have two states, either it's high popularity or low popularity. And as a consumer, you know, is interested in this item, he's going to get the utility two for purchasing a high item, high popularity, or negative one for purchasing a low, uh, low uh, popularity item. He can choose to not purchase anything, and in this case, get utility zero. A priori, the consumer believes that the probability of high I, uh, the probability that the item is high popularity is one quarter. Okay. Now, you know, the consumer can make a simple calculation to see whether he wants to purchase the item. He's going to purchase the item if and only if one has the expected utility for purchase, which is this simple calculation here, is at least zero, which is utility for not purchase. And this simple calculation shows that this is equivalent to the probability of high popularity is at least one third. Right, just some simple calculation, but you know the consumer now think that the the high uh, high popularity probability is only one quarter, so that's not enough to convince him to buy the item. And on the other hand, maybe the Booking.com he gonna get utility too whenever there's a purchase and a zero otherwise, because you know Booking.com don't care about the item is popular or not, just care about whether the purchase happens. But unfortunately, without doing anything. Uh, you know, the, the consumer wouldn't be convinced to buy the item. So the booking.com gonna get utility zero. Fortunately, the website has an information advantage. That is, the, you know, they usually can observe the realized state of high or low popularity because they can really monitor all the kind of browsing activities for this particular hotel or something. And therefore they can strategically reveal, signal this uh, realized state to influence uh, the consumer's purchase behavior. That's exactly why you see in the previous picture, there was something saying seven people purchased it in the past the five or four hours. And that's the information revelation. That's our question. Question, this setting and with a myopic receiver, there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the methods and the action. So isn't it like a classic MDP where instead of the action being purchased or not, the action is what methods you send? Uh, that's a great question. Yeah, you are far uh, uh, beyond, but uh, so it depends on how you model the belief of the agent. So if the belief of the agent is uh, exogenous, doesn't depend on anything happened before, you can uh, somehow reduce this to a very complicated MDP with complicated action space. But if the receiver at time edge the belief depends on the past receivers because you go to the website, you saw those reviews and stuff, then the problem will become uh, more difficult because that's kind of the non Markov in part, you miss Markov in part. Yeah. Okay, so it turns out that there's a way you, know, you can improve your, uh, the chance of convincing the consumer to buy the product. So, one simple way is you're going to be honest with the consumer. That is, whenever it's a high popularity item, you're going to tell the consumer this is high popularity. For example, give it a star or maybe say some sentence that this is in high demand. And whenever it's low popularity, you can just stay silent. Uh, that's you know, what happens in most of the website nowadays as well. And now from the consumer's perspective, if he see a kind of a star or recommendation, he know that this item is high popularity, he should purchase it. And this happens with the probability one quarter, right? So one quarter of the time you can convince the consumer to buy your product. Uh, is this the best way you can do? Uh, well, the answer is no. It turns out that you can do it in a more strategic way to significantly improve your utility. And here's what you can do. Whenever it's high popularity, of course, you're gonna say this is a you know, high demanding item. But when it's a low popularity, two out of the three of the time, you're gonna still say this is a high demanding item. Otherwise you say, you keep silent, you don't say anything. And now from a consumer's perspective, whenever he see a recommendation or a star <laughs> recommendation, he know that this item is not for sure high popularity. 
but a simple posterior update shows that it's going to be high popularity with probability one third, because you know one third comes from one third flow come from here, two thirds come from here. And as as we see before, this probability one third is large enough to con convince the consumer to buy the product, and this increases the probability of purchase to three quarters. And this just gives you a kind of concrete example to show how you can leverage your information advantage to influence the actions of another actor. Um, and this is what we call a signaling scheme. Um, it turns out that, any questions so far? Yes. I'm ignoring my prior, so I thought I had Oh, that's it, that you, you are not ignoring because this one third comes from exactly the prior here. Because of the prior, you know that 0.5 goes from here, 0.25 goes come from here. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I was assuming the planner has been on the market for a few years already, so the consumer knows what's going on. One thing that we're ignoring here is uh, reputation effects, essentially, right? Because uh, maybe if I'm booking.com and this just starts uh, on things that are not good, then uh, this will be the reputation about booking.com. Yeah, that's right. That's why I need the commitment. So after you commit, then you know, you're know going to follow this rule forever, which I think makes sense in most of the IT industry because uh, it's not so easy to you know, change your code to, to cheat for like half a day or two days and then go back to the Uh, and so I just so there's a kind of very kind of, uh, elegant interpretation of this uh, optim, uh, optimal persuasion process actually. So and that I'm going to mention this uh, kind of geometric interpretation of what this persuasion really means because it's going to help me to uh, to see where, how we can generalize this to the sequential setup. So if we if we look at the problem, recall that there's a kind of a threshold. The consumer's belief has a threshold which is one third. Uh, between, so if the probability of high is more than one third, the consumer is going to buy and the booking.com reward is two. Otherwise, the booking.com reward is zero, right? And if you recall that originally, the prior of the <coughs> consumer was here. Without doing anything, I, I cannot convince him to buy. But I had an optimal signaling scheme that somehow achieved the utility here, which is three quarters times two. Uh, times two. That was what I showed you before. And it turns out that this point lies exactly between these two points, okay? And moreover, I use the two signals. One is a star signal, one is a silent signal to achieve this utility. And that two signal correspond exactly to this point, which is conditioning the, the star signal, uh, conditioning on which the probability of high is one third. And then there's a silent signal condition on which the probability of high is zero. But this is one third here. And therefore, you can really view the signal scheme I showed you before as a convex decomposition of the prior here into some probability of silence and some probability of the star. And that's exactly how I achieved this uh, optimal signal scheme, uh, optimal utility here uh, as uh, the, this kind of linear combination. And this turns out to not be a coincidence uh, because uh, they, in a very uh, in, a, in a seminar paper by Kamenika and Jensko, they show that the sender's reward under optimal persuasion actually always lies at the concave closure of the sender's utility function. And in this, uh, in this figure, the concave closure is exactly this blue uh, figure here. That means you know, if I move the prior to here, I know that the optimal utility I'm gonna get is here. If I move it here, the optimal utility is gonna be here. This is kind of a very nice geometric interpretation of optimal persuasion that turns out to uh, make it very convenient to think about persuasion. Good. So, okay, so, so far so good, right? So we know how you can use information to influence agent behavior, but now you might ask, you know, why I needed the Markov process, right? And the reason is the following, in the previous static model, and you can see that it cannot capture how one consumer's shopping behavior may affect the future state of life. For example, if one consumer purchased the item, you could presumably assume at, for the next consumer, you're going to say the book this eight times in the past the six hours, not the seven anymore. And right, every consumer's behavior 
is kind of changing the, the popularity state for the next consumer. And that's why we need this kind of a Markov in, uh, state, uh, assume, uh, Markov in transition for the state to capture the evo evolution of the item state. Uh, yes. So my, this, so I, in many applications, I, I just feel like the, the actual state isn't changing. It's just what we know about. Right? Like I think of the state in your previous example as the underlying quality of the story, or the underlying quality of the um, right? Uh, What's yeah. changing is how much I know about whether it's good or bad. Right? It's like the history of signals that are received. Uh, yeah. So that so there is a so the way you are saying is uh, correct, but there is a kind of equivalent way to view it as the state is changing, because uh, depending on how you define your state, is it the true underlying uh, state which no one can observe, or it is the fine grained information that you can observe but the other people cannot observe. I'm thinking of in the latter case, but what are you thinking of the formal case? But this turns out to be mathematically equivalent on this argument. Ah, so okay. So the answer yeah. to my previous question is yes. Yeah. So it's like the belief for like other posterior belief on the right, quality. Right. Right. In which case then the consumers are controlling what the sender knows. Right. The state is now the belief. Uh, I think I'm more thinking of uh, that if the purchase if that if the consumer purchases. They all were not purchased. Then the uh, planner have a better estimation about the popularity, right. which is a posterior update. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay, so and that really leads us to the study of the Markov persuasion process. And the model is actually quite simple, very simple to think about. It's built on top of a very standard Markov decision process with state space S, action space A, transition kernel and a reward function. And for this talk, I'm gonna assume it's finite, but again, it's not necessary. You can do infinite uh, horizon as well. And the planner can only observe the state. So the planner is the only observer. And after he observed the state, which the actor do not observe, the planner can you know, execute some signaling policy to reveal this information to the actor. And the actor then you know, take action based on the information he receives. And this then leads to a state transition happens here and both agents is gonna to get to their own reward. Uh, as I said, uh, for this talk, I'm gonna assume the receiver is myopic, but uh, again, you, you can look at the, the far side, the receiver, uh, but that's just beyond the, this talk, but, but it's, it's totally valid to consider that. Uh, so and so here's a, here are a few quick notes on this model. The first thing is uh, compared to classic MDP planner, the planner in MPP has a limited influence over the actions because in MPP, you can pick whatever action you want. But here you have to really uh, incentivize the actor to take the action. And second, the assumption of the myopic receiver is just my modeling choice. Uh, um, and you, know, you, can, it's, you don't have to do this, uh, but I believe that it's indeed realistic in many applications that we care about. And there's also another caveat is uh, there are studies about far-sighted receiver in this Markov in process, but it was shown that it's actually very hard to optimize that model. Uh, this is due a very kind of a nice work recently by Gan et al, which I think also got the outstanding paper at uh, AAAI 2020, uh, 2022. <coughs> so that is hard, yes. So what, what makes um, the far-sighted receiver so the the bibs model is a you know very it's a, it is a kind of a far side on both sides uh, but not the, not, the, not the main model the yeah 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 but that, that model has a very special structure like how the state was transitions is a very special transition transition probability uh, if, I, if I remember, I think there is a terminal state, which is a. That's the main example to general to analysis of the model function. And also, I believe the agent have binary actions, right? 
Yeah, we can talk about that later offline, but I think my impression is that that model has a, a, a rich structure that allows you to uh, analyze and do a reduction to the to the uh, myopic version. But the anti harness come here comes from it's a due to that the model is an arbitrary utility function and arbitrary state transitioning. So yeah, that makes the problem basically a Markov game uh, with uh, a, a very a, a kind of general Markov game with two players. Both of them care about the long-term utility, and that turns out to be hard to solve computationally in general. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So another quick remark is that this I think this MDP model is a kind of multi-agent planning problem. Sometimes between MDP and the general Markov games, in the sense that it's a more slightly more complicated than MDP in the sense that there are another agents who are affecting our decision, but it is also less complicated than the Markov, general Markov games uh, because uh, the receiver is near is uh, myopic that allows you to do a better optimization. And that I think is kind of a, it's kind of a sweet point in the sense that it can capture some multi-agent problem, but it's not that, that hard uh, as the general Markov game, which is well known to be uh, hard to solve computationally. Yes. So to encode MDP in your setting, I would set the reward function of the, the planner to be called with the reward function. I think you need to change the action of, sets to the set of posterity. Yeah, you need to change the actions as well. And you also, also need to make the actor to be long term. <laughs> yeah, or is that you need to change the set of actions to the set of posterity and the action that will be taken by the actor? So I have. One action for each pair of posterior and the action to be taken by the receiver. Um, so I think you don't need to change the action because if you align the incentive between the planner and the actor, then the planner will always reveal for information because they have exactly the same utility, right? And that then the actor's planning problem is exactly the MDP planning problem. Because the planner's information revelation is trivial there, they have exactly the same utility, right? Yeah, I can chat uh, more up. What does the actor know? The actor know if uh, they know the algorithm, they know the reward functions of both. <laughs> what do they know? Uh, so the for the planning problem, everything is known, except that the planner knows the state, but the actor do not know the state. Otherwise, the utilities are known, the transitions are known. Just like a standard MDP, right? Everything is known. You just do the optimal planning. But in the reinforcement learning problem, you can think about the transition is not to know, or maybe the reward function is not to know. That, that, that's up to whether the problem you have or not. Okay, so good, yeah. Uh, and so, you know, this is obviously related to Bayesian persuasion and the Markov decision process, but a very related problem that I want to mention is the incentivized exploration, which I believe Alex is gonna talk more in this afternoon as well. <clears throat> and I want to particularly mention this problem because uh, IE and uh, MPP actually conceptually are trying to deal with the, 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 the same question. That is, uh, how can we use the information asymmetry to influence the agent's behavior so that we can optimize the long-term utility. But these two problems are actually fundamentally different in at least the two aspects. The first is that the planner's information advantage in the two model come from two different sources. In the MPP problem, the information advantage is that the planner knows the realized state, but the agent do not know. But in the uh, incentivized exploration, the information advantage comes from the planner knows the historical data, but the agent do not know. And that's not the case in MPP. In MPP, even the receiver knows all the historical data, he still do not know the realized state. And that's what the, uh, uh, that's what the only the planner knows. And the second key difference is the utility structure are different. So in MPP, we typically allow the arbitrarily misaligned utilities between the planner and the receiver, but in incentivized exploration, so far, typically the work we're gonna look at the tension between, the study the tension between long-term utility for the planner and the short-term utility for the agent. Uh, yeah. I'm so confused about the, the first bullet. So I thought current state comes from the posterior based on historical data, is that not 
if it's the Bayesian view of learning, isn't the historical data giving you the uh, feelings nice. that that's the state? No, uh, that, that is right. But I think there they use the historical data, which is realized the trajectory in the past, which help you to update your estimation <coughs> of the underlying MDP. This was the discussion we were having yeah. before. So. Uh, Beliefs are more appropriate. That's the whole point. So you can, as he correctly pointed out, think of the beliefs of the current state. Uh, I, your, your analysis next step. I guess another way to see the difference is uh, let's assume in the MPP, right? Let's say the agent can observe all the his, historical data, right? But they still don't know what's gonna, what is the realized the state at the current world. That's, that's the assumption in the MPP model, right? Just like the, you know, the consumer do not know the current popularity of the, of the hotel. And that's something only the planner knows. But uh, I guess in the incentivized explorer, in, in this case, the MPP still have the information advantage. But if in the incentivized exploration, if you assume the agent knows all the historical data, then there's no information advantage from the planner. Could it be the case that another example that's closer to what you're saying is inventory? I am observing how many items I have left, which is like perfectly observable by me. I have seen who has bought in the past, the agents have not. So I can track my inventory, transitions according to the previous decisions, and the game goes on the way that you are describing it. Yeah, yeah that, that was right. And yeah, good. we can we can chat more. Um, uh, okay, so that is the model. So um, for the rest of the time, I think I'm probably gonna go through this part, uh, which I think uh, we have some characterization, but a lot of open problem as well. So let's look at the optimal planning MPP. Um, to illustrate the idea of how do you do optimal planning, let's kind of uh, continue with the previous example I showed you. Uh, but now let's assume there were a, a bunch of consumers, you know, there were three consumers arrived <coughs> sequentially and they're, they're all interested in this hotel. And the popularity of the hotel is going to evolve as the current consumer going to book it or not book it, right? That's the state of nature going to evolve. So how do I do optimal planning in this problem? And the idea is still similar to MVP, just to do backward induction, but you need to do it in a kind of more careful way. So uh, let's look at, let's start from the last consumer, which is consumer C. And for, you know, let's assume, let's, uh, for simplicity, let's say this C was the, uh, the guy that I was talking about before. So his utility function can at least to the booking.com's reward as this. And that's the picture you saw before. And we know that the optimal persuasion basically is trying to concavify this curve to get the optimal utility from this uh, receiver C. So that, that's already what we saw before. Uh, and the second step is now I want to look at the receiver B, right? So I need to do it in two steps. The first step is I'm gonna compute the raw reward function R tilde B for this receiver B. By the raw reward function, I mean, I don't do persuasion. I just try to see how much utility I'm gonna get just without any revealing any information. So therefore the receiver is gonna behave according to his prior belief P. And if P was, which is the probability of high, is large enough to induce the booking, then my utility is going to be RB1. One, it stands for booking and zero stands for not booking, uh, SB, plus my future reward, which will be transitioning according to the transition kernel for action one and multiply the current uh, uh, prior, uh, uh, prior belief P. Because that's going to be the belief for the next consumer C. Uh, if my probability is not enough to induce, is induce no booking, then I get a different reward and the transition happens according to a different kernel as well. And that is how I computed the R tilde. Uh, but this is a raw reward function. I didn't do any persuasion yet. So the next step is I'm gonna do persuasion. That is, uh, as I mentioned before, this is to concavify this R tilde function uh, to become the optimal utility under persuasion. So here's a really, here's an example for the two steps. I start from R2 to the B and this, so I didn't show you the numbers for this uh, receiver B, but I did work out some numerical example, which turns out to have four pieces uh, for this R2 to the B. Then I can do a concavification to get my RB. And I can continue this until the first step. And that's how you can do 
uh, this kind of uh, Bellman updates in this uh, in this model. And uh, the only caveat here is that the number of pieces for this R2 to the B function is going to increase exponentially in the number of iterations. And that is why the problem actually turns out to be hard in general, computationally hard, uh, to figure out the optimal, uh, optimal policy. So, Stefan, I think yeah. the answer to the earlier question I asked is actually a step three. So, my suggestion was having an action which was clear, but you're just saying from the patient to the solution, you just need to find clarify. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I can. Okay. But, so, but to summarize the previous procedure, you actually can derive a similar Bellman objects for this uh, uh, MTP via the recursive concavification idea. So, essentially, you can show that the planar's optimal accumulated reward can be described by the following recursive formulation. The first step is basically for the receiver to make the action. The receiver is going to pick the best NH according to his prior belief, P. Uh, and this NH then will induce a, a planar utility, which is uh, the current utility RH plus the future utility after the edge. And then after that, it's the planar's optimization, which can, is going to be a concavification of the R2. And you're going to recursively do, do, do this thing. Uh, this generalizes the standard Bayesian persuasion problem to multiple horizons. And uh, also in a standard MVP, Right, when you only have a single agent making decisions, you only have the first step. The Bellman equation only has the first step. And of course, <coughs> uh, the agent will optimize this, this utility, uh, not just the my output. So that is the MPP. But in this MPP, you would have you would need two steps because uh, each step because because you have two agents basically. So each agent is going to need to make a decision during this uh, 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 update. Uh, is this uh, clear? Okay, so now, so you know, we have a characterization of the optimal utility, but so as a computer scientist, we typically look at how can I compute the optimal policy, right? Uh, but it turns out that even though I have this characterization, the optimal, uh, the optimization problem actually is quite challenging. Uh, this characterization does not directly imply an efficient algorithm, because what I need to do is to compute this continuous function, RHP, high dimensional function for any edge from you know, one to capital H. And it turns out that this R H is a piecewise linear function. The last one has a capital uh, cardinality num A pieces uh, uh, where A is a number of actions. And as you go forward, the number of pieces is gonna increase exponentially uh, in, term, in, in the number of runs. And that's why you know, I actually cannot have a general algorithm to compute the optimal policy. Um, and it turns out that there were some kind of special, special cases where you can have tractability. Um, one example is the following case. I was previously, I was assuming the receiver can only know the previous uh, uh, signaling scheme and the signals. But if we assume the receiver can observe the entire history, particularly the previous action and the state, then we can show that the optimal policy in this case can be computed uh, uh, in polynomial time. So why this simplifies the problem? Uh, the reason is because in this case, we don't need to compute the entire uh, reward function RH uh, because there aren't that many prior beliefs that I need to keep track of. Because for receiver at time H, there are only this many numbers of possible, uh, his, uh, of the possible event at H minus one. And these are the things that are gonna affect my belief at time H. And there aren't that many possible beliefs that, that I need to handle. In this case, it turns out that I can compute the optimal uh, policy for each of the belief uh, recursively in an efficient way. Um, it turns out that you can gen really generalize this to kind of uh, uh, to a contextual setup by viewing the AH minus one, SH minus one as the context for the receiver edge at time edge. And in you, you know, the context in general doesn't have to be like this, but it can be arbitrary context. And you can generalize it to that setup, uh, have a efficient algorithm there. And the idea is similar. It's really because uh, I don't need to compute the entire reward function. I only need to compute the reward function at a few uh, prior possible prior beliefs that can happen. Okay, 
So I have um, so in the so uh, in the remaining of the time, I think I will just uh, briefly mention the challenges for you to do reinforcement learning in this problem, and then I'll, I'll conclude. So you know the reinforcement learning problem is very natural, just as the you know RL problem in standard MDP. The reason here is because uh, you know typically the transitions uh, of the kernel are typically unknown, or maybe the reward function are unknown. And in this case, you want to play the game. Uh, while learning those transition kernels. Uh, for, um, so I just want to mention a few additional, additional challenges that doesn't present in the standard MDP, but it would happen here. So the first thing is that you cannot easily explore every action uh, in the MPP because the planner has a limited power. You cannot just say, I want to pick that action or that action. You have to incentivize the receiver to take the action without the perfect knowing your MDP. And that turns out to be challenging to uh, handle. And what, the way we do it is we're going to assume some non-degeneracy assumption. That is, uh, you know, the persuasion process would allow me to explore every action that I want. Maybe it takes longer because I have a limited power, but ultimately I should be able to explore every action. So that is going to be an assumption that I will need. Uh, this is a similar to the you know, MDP. MDP have a similar assumption of kind of exploring every action as well. Yes. Is this an assumption on the primitives or is it an assumption on I'm hoping that there will be equilibria where I will be able to use any action I want to explore? Uh, it's an assumption on the primitives. It's not, a, uh, it's not a equilibria. I just, uh, I just uh, need to be able to explore all the action in some way, not, not necessarily the equilibrium model. Good. Another challenge is uh, here, the small estimation error may lead to larger loss because uh, you know if you have a small estimation error, maybe for your utility it doesn't change much, but the receiver may switch to a completely different action, which may be a disaster for you. And uh, therefore, because this is really due to the multi-agent situation, you know sometimes my utility changes a little bit, but my my opponent may change his uh, uh, switch to his action, which may be a harm to me. So to handle this case. We essentially try to robustly induce some kind of desired uh, receiver action. So we're going to make sure that within all the uncertainties, I will induce the same receiver behavior robustly. And that's what we mean by the pessimism part in our algorithm design. Uh, the, another, the, the final challenge is the estimation error may propagate through the time uh, since the receiver edges belief you know, it depends on what our estimation in the past. Um, and when estimating the value, so more specifically, when estimating the value of a given trajectory, uh, any estimation error before H will affect the estimation error of the receiver H's belief. And this doesn't happen in standard uh, RIO in MDP. Uh, when you fix a trajectory, and it turns out that in, when arguing the sample efficiency proof for the, uh, for the, uh, for, uh, in the RIO, we will need to we will need this step that we cannot handle and that is why so this is somehow a difficult problem that we cannot handle so far what we can what we can do is to assume that the receiver's belief is somehow independent of the history uh, so whatever happened in the past it wouldn't affect the receiver edge's belief and under this assumption it turns out we can have a sample efficient algorithm uh, for for r l in mpp and you know this kind of is realistic in some situation, but not in some other situations. Yes. Is this the exogenous, exogenous belief that you mentioned? Yeah, exactly. This is the exogenous. Then belief. how is it just different from the exact mapping from projectable? Uh, it's not. I would say it's not fundamentally different. Yeah, the, the actual space is going to be different. You are designing a signal in scheme. And uh, you need to induce the desired uh, receiver action in order to make sure he doesn't be able to action you don't like. Uh, but other than that, I think that it's fundamental. I assume you assume that the sender knows this particular exogenous problem. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so th this is the uh, how far we can go so far, but I think there's a, a, a long way to go. So. So by combining this with the, the standard optimism uh, in, uh, in MDP planning, we get this optimism pessimism principle for persuasion process. That's our algorithm uh, due to time. 
interest. I'm not going to show it in detail, but uh, it's basically a kind of a very, very kind of a simple procedure combines optimism and pessimism. And we can show that this algorithm is going to have uh, square root of t uh, and square root of h for its regret. So there were some pr proof techniques that I'm, I'm going to skip. I'll just uh, stop here by summarizing. So we introduced the novel model of a Markov persuasion process applicable to many digital platforms. We have uh, some we have algorithm for the optimal planning on RL under some kind of assumptions, uh, but I would say in general there's a lot of uh, open directions. Um, so, for example, how tight is our result? Uh, what about the algorithm for general MPP? Uh, how do we efficiently learn when you don't assume the receiver's belief is exogenous? Uh, and there were many other variants of the problem as well. For example, what if the receiver what if you don't know the receiver utility neither? What if the receiver is uh, far side as well? What if there are multiple receivers <coughs> that is the same wrong? So all these questions are. <coughs> so that's it for my talk. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, everyone.